folks, welcome back to World War II TV, and I hope you've been enjoying Aviation in the Pacific week number two as much as I have. But let's be fair, it has been quite high level, and I mean that with the pun in intended there. A lot of talk about B-29, strategic bombing at high level, obviously lots of discussions, atomic bombs. I think what you guys have been waiting for is hearing about fighter bombers whipping in at treetop level, up valleys and knocking stuff out with, you know, flames and machine guns and rockets. Well, that's what we brought you today. So it's two guests for the price of one today. In fact, I don't pay my guests anything. Henry Sledge has been on twice already before. You know, his father, of course, we all know who he was. Eugene Sledge, author with the old breed. But he's brought along a buddy today, Damon Stout, who is a filmmaker and musician and composer who is working on a film about the unit we're talking about today. Just before I bring them in, if you are new to the channel, well, firstly, welcome on board. We've had a, a, a good number of new uh, subscribers this week. If you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Press the button and also press the little bell so you get the notifications and all the information you need is in the description on the YouTube page there. So open it up and you have links to the guests' websites, their projects, their books, their trailers for their movies, their documentaries, and the social media links you'll need. So all of that is in there now. So I'm going to bring my two guests in now. So Damon Stout and Henry Sledge, so I'll bring them both in. So good afternoon, guys. How are you both today? Henry, how are you? I'm doing good, Paul. Doing good. How are you? I am very well. And you're sitting in your incredible war room there with your, <laughs> your incredible relics behind you there, which is fantastic. Damon, first time appearance on World War II TV. Uh, good afternoon to you. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, for having me. I appreciate it. So we, we've been deciding, folks, kind of how we're going to do this. And we haven't got We've got lots of display material to show you, but we haven't really worked out a particular order in which way we're going to tackle things. We're a bit more of an improvised show, which is how we like them. But we're going to start today with Henry, starting with some quotes that his father wrote about close air support in Peleliu. So we'll start with that, and, um, and then we'll show up some relevant images when it gets that appropriate bit. So over to you, Henry. Okay, thanks, guys. Yeah, so I'm reading just a couple of paragraphs from my dad's book with the old breed. And, and this is just a couple of paragraphs that I think sets the tone for what we're trying to do today. And that is talk about VMF 114. That's Marine Fighting Squadron 114, the Death Dealers. Those guys were not dueling with F4Fs out over the slot in Guadalcanal, shooting down hordes of zeros like Pappy Boyington was. These guys were doing work a day, grunt air war, pounding the Japanese, paving the way for guys like my dad to hit the beach. What I'm reading from is when K-35 was going to hit the beach, or 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines were about to hit the beach, 13 days into the battle, they're going ashore at Ingecebus. So here's what he wrote about that, because it's a beautiful description of Marine aviators doing what they did best. Our Amtraks moved to the water's edge and waited for H hour as the thunderous pre-landing naval gunfire bombardment covered the little island in smoke, flame, and dust. The Corsairs from Marine Fighter Squadron VMF-114 peeled off and began bombing and strafing the beach. The engines of the beautiful blue gold wing planes roared, whined, and strained as they dove and pulled out. They plastered the beach with machine guns, bombs, and rockets. The effect was awesome as dirt, sand and debris spewed into the air. Our Marine pilots outdid themselves and we cheered, yelled, waved and raised our clenched fists to indicate our approval. Never during the war did I see fighter pilots take such risks by not pulling out of their dives until the very last instant. We were certain more than once that a pilot was pulling out too late and would crash. But expert flyers that they were, they gave that beach a brutal pounding without mishap to plane or pilot. We talked about their spectacular flying even after the war ended. And then if I could read just a footnote and then we'll dive right into the discussion. Um, Ingecebus was one of the first American amphibious assaults where air support for the landing force came exclusively from Marine aircraft. In earlier landings, air support came from Navy and sometimes Army planes. So having set the tone, I hope, by reading that, let's let's jump in and meet who these guys were from VMF 114. Well, I think before we'll do that is we'll we'll talk about Damon's project and how the two of you came together, just so that we know we all know who you are, Henry. You're the son of a legend, and if I may say so, with all your podcast work, you're something of a legend yourself now. But Damon, <laughs> uh, 
Emmy winning composer, but your connection with the, with this unit is also very personal. So just a bit of an introduction to yourself and, and, and your connection with, with what who we're talking about. Sure. So this starts for me back in 2017. Uh, basically, the short version of all of this is Cowboy, who's the, the CEO of 114, is a cousin. Granted, a very distant cousin. Uh, but as I started to explore his career um, and found out, you know, he's served in Guadalcanal, had six six kills. Um, the history of this, I found Bud wrote this book. So Bud is is really the genesis of this whole project. So this is uh, Glenn Daniel. So he's, he's Cowboy's wingman. Um, there you go. There's the book. So I found this book. Uh, and got a chance to interview Glenn in Tucson before he passed um, a couple times, actually. So it was it was quite an amazing, just dropped in the middle of this this story, um, who these guys are. I met uh, Pat Scannon, who started Bent Prop, which is now Project Recover. Uh, met him. He basically gave me, I think, 1,200 or so photographs of 114, because Pat would always go to the uh the um when they got reunions. together again yeah, reunions. They, yeah. yeah the reunions so you know suddenly i'm in talking to bud i'm i'm injecting myself into this history uh trying to absorb it it's it was just an amazing amount of detective work as well um you know some of the slides that you're showing are are from archival footage that i've found and discovered and was either gifted or or you know spent hundreds of hours looking for um, the, the slide that you were showing earlier about the Angus attack, that was actually the AAR uh, in War Diary page of that day. And I found the corresponding color film of that strafing run. So that's that slide. That's actually, you know, a, a longer clip of color film uh, of that happening. So anyways, all this stuff just to say, uh, and Henry reached out, we're, we're collaborating now into the extent of my, you know, my background is n really nothing to do with the, the history of this. I mean, of course, now it is because this is almost five years of my life. I've been working on this project. But, um, you know, ha having Henry on board is, is great just so we can kind of collaborate. And, uh, you know, my, my take on this is going to be the personal side because not only Cowboy was killed, uh, his younger brother, Jack, was also killed. Uh, and so in Bud's book, you know, there's, there's quite a gut-wrenching story of when Bud went into Cowboy's tent the day Cowboy got the telegram that his younger brother was killed. Uh, so, you know, there's so, in a good way, it's it's overwhelming how many people, how many stories exist with 114. Uh, and then just on the periphery, some of these photos that you're seeing are, you know, Jack Conger, uh, Cantrell, Bastion. There's a lot of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hearing from relatives as well reaching out, doing interviews. I think at this point I've traveled or flew about uh, 24,000 miles, I think is the last I figured this thing out. Just obviously, you know, Peleliu was <laughs> was the bulk of the traveling. But before Bud Pass, I did get to edit together uh, some clips, um, you know, trailers, teasers, whatever you want to call it, um, just to show him kind of where I'm at, the progress. I, I got to call Bud from the, the airstrip his airstrip, as I called it, um, I managed to to crash a drone on <laughs> on his airstrip, so he got a kick out of that. But anyway, well, so yeah, we're we're both yeah. very excited, I think, to kind of see this come to fruition soon. Well, that's a great introduction, and and I think you know, as we said at the beginning, there, you know, the focus of this week has been on that high level um, aspect of the air war in the Pacific because it's. I mean, we talked about the B-29 program is the single most expensive program in World War II, costing more than even the Manhattan Project, $3 billion. So uh, and it, and it, where, whatever we think about the morality of the atomic bomb, it brought an end to the war. It lead, led to the, to the B-52s in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And so I think that's where the focus. Then the other focus, and you mentioned it yourself, Damon, is that kind of fighter on a fighter action, the, the kind of the zeros. And, the, and, and then there's all the midway and those naval battles, those carrier battles. And I think somewhere along the line, 
the, the, that kind of ground support role, although incredibly important to the guys who were on these hell, hellish islands, has kind of fallen through the cracks a bit. And it's an important aspect of the Pacific. Um, but I think it's been it's been overlooked. So it's great to great that you guys are bringing it to, to the forefront again, because it, it, it needs telling. So who wants to start off with the formation of the squadron and, and, and whether or not the, the its purpose was kind of defined at the beginning? Because as we know, with everything to do with the Pacific campaign, the learning curve is incredibly steep and they learn by their mistakes. Men in the army, the Marines, they're going in there at the beginning of the war, kind of often under-equipped, under-practiced, mm -hmm. and then gradually as the war goes on, everything gets better and better and better, and the LVT is coming and so on and so forth. So close air support, who wants to start, like, start the ball rolling about, you know, what the concept was when the USA entered the war and how the MF-114 uh, comes into it? Henry, go ahead. This is your... <laughs> well, I guess to, to kick that off, uh, Woody, and, and that's, a, you know, excellent question, of course. So if you look at VMF-114, most of those guys did... I don't think any of them... Well, let me say it like this. By the time a lot of those guys got into VMF-114, many of them never saw a Japanese fighter in combat. Right. Because by the time VMF-114, or the Death Dealers, as they were known, by the time the Death Dealers got to Peleliu, which was late September of 44, we, you know, we were mid to late 1944. So the, the air war in the Pacific had evolved beyond the what I mentioned earlier you know, the, the clouds of F4F -F Wildcats, you know, the Cactus Air Force uh, taking off from Guadalcanal and flying up the slot and, and duking it out with clouds of Japanese Zeros and Fowls and Kates coming down the slot from her ball to attack American shipping and try to hit the guys of Guadalcanal. And it had moved on up to Bougainville, which is where we saw VF-17, which is the Navy uh, Skull and Crossbones Jolly Roger Squadron, you know, Tom Blackbird and Ira Kefford and those guys. Uh, and they they really started making the Corsair because it, it came extant in late 1943. Uh, they started turning that into a real tool of war. You know, you had Pappy Boynton and VMF 214, you know, just in, engaged in these iconic air-to-air uh, -air battles uh, over Bougainville and, and approaching uh, Rabal in an effort to neutralize that. And Rabal, of course, was this, this never-ending, it seemed, pipeline of Japanese naval air power. Uh, not to mention you had Japanese army air power coming out of New Guinea, but that's kind of a, a, another story. After mission, after mission, after mission, finally the Americans succeeded in grinding down Japanese air power resources. Um, and so by the time you get into late 1944, you have what is like when I read uh, what I think is probably the best book on this subject, uh, Robert Sherrod's book, uh, USMC Aviation in World War II. You know, it's considered the Bible of this stuff of, of marine aviation and its birth and, and, and evolution throughout World War II. Uh, Sherrod described it in his book as being the doldrums of 1944, because by that time, you know, there was, there were none of these glorious air to air battles. I mean, guys were lucky if they saw a Japanese fighter in the skies because most of them had been beaten back at that point, but there still was a crucial job to do. And you had Marine fighter squadrons like the MF-114 coming into the theater and they are flying day after day, flying these non-glorious, you know, there's nothing sexy about it. They're, they're taking off. Now, now the Inga uh close air support was pretty iconic. Uh, because it was it was well documented, well noticed, but after that, VMF 114 and then VMF 121 and VMF 122, two other Marine fighter squadrons uh, came onto Peleliu, and they are flying day in and day out these workaday missions, taking off with 500 pound bombs, thousand pound bombs, flying up uh, the Palau Islands, up to Koror, Babelthorpe, the northern Palau Islands and hitting Japanese shipping in Koror Harbor. They're attacking Japanese anti-aircraft positions. But but that was after the Battle of Peleliu ended, which was, you know, November of 44. I will say this, VMF-114, while many of its pilots may not have seen Japanese fighters in combat, you had guys like Bill Cantrell, you had guys like Gaylord Greenfield, you had guys like 
Bud Daniel, who was Cowboys wingman. These were highly trained, highly capable, excellent aviators who were thorough, consummate professionals at what they did. They just happened to get into it a little bit too late to see Japanese fighters in combat. One thing that does need to be pointed out about the Death Dealers, and that's a, a great picture of them right there, they, they had in the personage of Robert Stout, Damon's cousin, in the personage of Robert Stout and Jack Conger, they had a direct tie to that bloodline of the earlier fighter, the iconic fighter combat that was going on over Guadalcanal because Conger and Stout had both flown in VMF 212 with Harold Joe Bauer in the earlier days of the war. And, and it, you know, Conger was, Damon, what was he, a six kill ace? Yeah. Um, I know Cowboy had well, six kill. Yeah, Cowboy had six. I think Conger might have been seven or eight. I think he had a couple up on him. And so between the two of them, there there was that bloodline back to those heady days of, you know, dueling Japanese fighters over the slot. Uh, but then but then you had, you know, like I said, guys coming in after the fact, like Bill Cantrell and Gaylord Greenfield and, and Bud Daniel. And, and, you know, these were thorough professionals, uh, but they just came in slightly later. But the job they were doing required an, uh, an incredible amount of skill and bravery. Uh, because, it, you know, what, what happened on Ingo Sebas on D plus 13, and what I mean by that is 13 days into the Battle of Peleliu, yep. these guys were flying close air support for the Marines every day. They were, you know, you had Bloody Nose Ridge. Paul, you know, Woody, you and I have talked enough. You, you, you've seen the pictures I took when I went to Peleliu, and you've read my dad's book. You know, and so have you, Damon. I mean, you, you know the grinding struggle that the, the mud Marines were facing on a daily basis trying to take the ridges of Peleliu. I don't know that they could have done it without VMF 114 and the other guys, 121 and 122, flying the missions right off the tip of the airfield up to five sisters, you know, into that collective system known as the Umar Brogel or also Bloody Nose Ridge, as it was more commonly known. Uh, and so these 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 aviators were taken off. As, as they're famously described as never raising their landing wheels. I've seen comments on Facebook sites comments made by people who fly warbirds who actually, you know, they say, well, that's not actually true because in the Corsair, the Corsair landing gear, you retracted it and then you, you press the lever for dive brake and the mains came down, leaving the tail wheel retracted. And that acted as your dive brake. A lot of them did that. However, you can see pictures as, as I'm sure Damon, you have, mm -hmm. you see Corsairs about to drop napalm or thousand pounders, on Japanese positions in, in the ridges, and you can tell that their tail wheel and their mains are down. So point being, sometimes they just took off from, from the airfield and never raised their landing gear because literally they're they're flying five minutes from, from the end of the airfield uh, to get to where they're gonna start dropping their ordnance. And that was beautifully captured by the way in the Pacific mini series. Hmm. Yeah. Well, a great, great, great explanation there. Um, Peleliu is obviously the focus of today's show. It's the focus of where your father was, Henry, and of course the, the focus of, of everything we're talking about. But we had John McManus on, uh, who, who we all love and respect, talking about the Solomon Islands. General in Guadalcanal is in many ways, if Midway is the naval turning point, Guadalcanal is the amphibious landing turning point. Yeah, there's the pre-Guadalcanal chapter and there's the post-Guadalcanal chapter where things have just things start getting better. How to do this stuff gets better. So Guadalcanal, what generally was at close air support like in Guadalcanal? Because that's when they're kind of, I'm not going to use the word inventing it, but it's kind of on the on the job understanding what the people on the ground need and what the people in the air can do. So how significant is Guadalcanal in the kind of the learning curve of what can be done with Corsairs later when we get to 44 and Peleliu? Oh, it was it was uh, hugely significant because when the Marines landed on on seven August of forty two, I mean they were at the end of a shoestring. They had they had nothing to help them at all, you know. And then it's a couple weeks into the battle that the F four F Wildcats show up, um, and and it was it's some some F four F Wildcats and SBD Dauntless dive bombers that that show up. And and I know my dad's friend Sid Phillips, who was in the um, first Marines wrote a note in, in the unit history, you know, famously describing how the, the, the F4S came in and just were flying circles around the field and the pilots and tail gunners, the SPDs were waving at them. And they're, you know, they're down there 
pumping their fists and yelling and giving them a thumbs up from the ground because they were so beleaguered. You know, the Japanese were coming down the slot every day uh, and at night, too, and uh, pounding them with with uh, naval gunfire, uh, landing reinforcements practically at will. And so to have marine aviation and, and Cactus Air Force, which is the collective name for the uh, allied planes that were flying from Guadalcanal supporting our troops, you know, there were Navy guys involved in that, too. There were Army planes. I don't want to leave them out. Uh, you had P-40s and P-38s showing up, uh, but it was an ad hoc force marshalling whatever we could to, to try to stem the tide. Mm. And Damon, so do you want to... The Walt Canal can't be underrated there. Do you want to jump in on what some of these photos are? And also, what can't we, 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 we'll get to the men soon because, sure. you know, as a Brit, we kind of have this idea that fighter pilots in the RAF are, are one type of person and bomber pilots and crews are something else and the coastal command was something else. So the Marine pilots who ended up in this unit, what, was there something in your research? Because, you know, you said yourself, though, you're not a historian. You're coming at this from another angle, but you've got the family connection. You know, is there something about the kind of guys who 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 are good at this that you could say, well, they were good at this because of and, and sort of recognize a single quality they had that that made them special? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit cliche, but obviously the kind of type A personality, um, you know, again, my my connection with this is literally it's Bud, um, you know, having the honor and the privilege and pleasure to, to chat with him and become friends and um, just incredibly humble, just the nicest guy you ever want to meet. But you can tell, I mean, they, they don't take crap and they know what they're doing. And, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, um, I, I think too, you know, if you're 20 something and you're flying multi-million dollar aircraft, it's, you know, the equivalent of a, a spaceship back then. Most of these kids never left the farm. Um, and so you're, you're in this amazing situation, this, you know, albeit terrible um and you're forced to rise to this level and i think you know every every person i've interviewed every person that i've met um has that quiet humility but there's the confidence in there so yeah fighter pilot bomber escort all that type of stuff when i was growing up in um, michigan one of our neighbors was a b24 pilot and i i, I never knew that like as a kid I mean, he just never talked about it. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the other, I guess, part of this is, is I wouldn't say refusal to talk about it, but maybe once you ingratiate yourself and, you, you know, it's not just a kind of flash in the pan interest, then then maybe they, they open up a bit about some of the service. Mm -hmm. um, but to your point, um, with some of the Guado pictures you're showing, um, so first of all, thank you, by the way, for... Um, Showing all this stuff, this is, you know, in theory, all of this is going to be in the film. Um, but to find kind of these pictures of Cowboy when he was younger in Guadal uh, is amazing. Just, you know, stumbling, that's him. So stumbling across this when he's first lieutenant, and uh, as Henry already mentioned, underneath uh, Joe Bauer, which, quick side note, they kind of unfortunately paralleled each other in the sense of, you know, meeting their, their end. Um, and and be loved by their their men, um, the responsibilities of that. But um, yeah, just finding finding this stuff. One thing that I did run into, and I still am running into a snag on Guadal information for the documentary. I have you know the the broad strokes and the and, and whatnot. But as far as getting war diaries and AARs, um, I forget Henry. What was it? There was a fire somewhere in one of the libraries. I think it was 1973. Yeah, I, I want to say. So, so Cowboy was with what you're looking at now is uh, 212. So basically, all these pictures from from Guadal is when uh, Cowboy Conger and Bastion, who subsequently and were in 114 later, but we're all in uh, 212. Uh, but yeah, is that Cowboy lower right front row. Yeah, yeah, the mustache. But yeah, so it was. <laughs> You, you know, part like I said, it's filmmaker, detective, whatever you want to call it. It's it's jumping into the subject matter, endless phone calls and emails, and you know, travel, you know, meet people. Uh, fascinating, fascinating work to do. Fascinating because of the family connection, of course. But unlike um, you know, unlike fiction, this this is real. <laughs> it sounds obvious to say that, but it's um, 
don't mess it up. You know, I, I kind of have in the back of my head the whole uh, doing the, doing this justice as much as you want. Damon, do we, do we want to touch on the fact that one of the things that makes us so poignant is VMF-114 shows up, they do their job, Cowboy does his job, he leads the squadron, he has a quiet confidence of affability that people find comfort in. Do we Do we want to get into how the war ended for him, or do we want to save that? No, I mean, it's, you know, roughly public record um, in the sense that, um, yeah, he was, unfortunately, he was killed. So, um, but right there next to him, based on this book, like I said, when I read this, I jumped on a plane and, and met Bud. Literally, like, I think it was like right before Christmas of uh, 2017. And then in July of 2018, I'm in Palau. So this is how quick, you know, I wanted to move on all of this stuff and, you know, joked with Bud, you know, because of your book, I'm in the middle of the South Pacific. Thanks. <laughs> of course, he got a kick out of that, too. But yeah, so unfortunately, Cowboy was killed um, pretty much, I think, when 114 was going to be leaving anyways. It was March 4th of 45, uh, It was and it was a strafing mission up to Koror, you know, so close to the end of the war. Uh, yep. But and he actually it, had the opportunity to go home um, months prior and, and wouldn't. You know, he, he wasn't going to leave until his whole squad could leave. Um, but anyways, yeah, unfortunately, so, and Bud was flying wing with him, um, and it was a three, it was all three squads. So it was 121, 122, and 114 on March 4, 45, and the mission was Battery Hill. Once again, that's up in Karor. Um, and, you know, hindsight and all that type of stuff. Was there anything strategic about that? No. I mean, this was toward the end. It was it was just further knocking out any aircraft and supplies <clears throat> and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so it was the morning of, and all three squads kind of rendezvoused 10 miles out, you know, north, southeast, west type of thing. And, um, you know, researching this, too, that's the other part of this is like trying to get as much accurate because the war diary, the AAR tells you what, you know, tells you what you're going to. That's that's all you can go on. But you have to understand the fog of war, fog of battle. Um, you know, certain things didn't line up. Um, not not that there's major inaccuracies. It was just what happened to Cowboy. Uh, Bud's recollection. I actually got a really good map from researching, I think it was 121 or 122's AARs, um, just a hand drawn map of where everybody was, the types of ordnance that were dropped. Um, so when Cowboy was killed, my understanding is 114 was 10 miles out. They were flying two by two, basically 10 miles out. And as they got closer to the target, this is like 30 feet above the water, by the way. Mm -hmm. As they got closer to the target, they went single file. So Cowboy was first, Bud was right behind him. And it was up and over. And we can get to it at some point, but there's, you know, video I think I sent you of like the mangrove area and Peleliu stuff. But kind of went up and over to hit the target. Um, he was hit and basically kind of, you know, up and to the left listed. Bud was also hit, kind of got blown up and over. So that's the area, basically. So Battery Hill is right past that ridge and let me let me jump in and say paul or way this is like 40 miles north of peleliu that this is flying up up the ocean you know 40 miles north of peleliu one of your more northern palau islands where most of the japanese troops and and assets were you know there were 10 or 11 thousand on peleliu um but this is to put it in perspective for me this is after the Battle of Peleliu was long since won, guys like my dad were gone. They, they, uh, by this time, 1st Marine Division is back on Pavuvu and the Russell Islands, resting and refitting, getting ready for their next show, which is going to be Okinawa. But guys like our Marine aviators here were still on Peleliu flying missions up there to, to bus shipping and anti-aircraft. And there was nothing nothing glorious about it. But, but Damon's footage here, it just shows the nature of the terrain and, and Damon, I'll let you take it back from there. Yeah. I mean, I, just that, that jump, this is in that dreadful a type of role that John McManus references that is referred to in the books as the mopping up operations, both on the ground and in the air. It which, really is. 
which mm -hmm. makes it sound like you're literally a cleaning woman with some kind of mop. But in fact, actually, it's right. still deadly stuff. And as you said there, the battle has been won, but there's still this just horrible cleaning up, removing the last ditch defenders, removing the last ditch anti-aircraft positions. And it's just a horrible, thankless task that the, the exactly. press only pile on those kind of they've, they've all gone now. They've moved on. The battle's moved on. And so no one's recover, you know, reporting this. This, I'm going to say it again, this mopping up kind of work. But, but back to you, Damon. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And so that was kind of what I wanted to cover in the documentary, obviously, is um, this final mission is, is, is so integral, obviously, to end one's life for this. But, you know, having these interviews that exist, either the ones I've done or Pat, actually, Pat Scannon did um, years prior in one of the reunions. Thank God he did, because I have access to, while well, some of these pilots were still left, and there's amazing footage of them sitting around saying, you know, we've never talked about this before when, when Cowboy was killed. Meaning, of course, they've all talked about it, but not in this group setting. Mm -hmm. So having this, you know, the AA fire, the flak everywhere, you know, I'm envisioning like literally it's like the sun's behind them at 6 a.m. 10 miles out and you're 30 feet above the ocean to go hit this thing that arguably, you know, doesn't really need it. Um, but there is uh, one of the pilots in, in the older interview. Um, and I forget if it was uh, Cantrell, but somebody basically commented that, it, you know, it was one of these... Marines don't fly around something type of thing. So that, my understanding is when they had missions maybe up in Babeldop or somewhere else from Peleliu, like Henry said, 30, 40 miles up, they would just kind of bypass Karor because it was just ensconced with AA fire throughout the whole war. So it was a hornet's nest. Yeah, so there's nothing tactical at this point. Like you said, Paul, they've won for all intents and purposes. So they would fly around Karor to do other missions. So one of the stories um, is this, that one of the COs that was supposedly right out of West Point, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you can kind of figure out the rest, but ha had some comment famously of Marines don't fly around AA fire. So hence, you know, I don't know if that's true. That's that's just something you, you hear as you do this research, mm -hmm. but hence this, this kind of final mission, so to speak, on uh, March 4th, 45 was this coordinated attack, three squadrons. What would it, what 30 some odd planes, 40 some odd planes. Uh, one, one, one real quick side note. Um, I don't know if this speaks to the accuracy of this particular CEO saying Marines don't fly around or whatever, but it was either 121 or 122, the ordinance. And I had to double, triple check this because I thought this clearly has to be a typo. There's no way they dropped this, but it was depth charges. They dropped depth charges on land, which I've never heard of my whole life, but it's documented and I guess there is a reason for it. I, I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Wow. Anyway. Well, to, to further underscore the danger of what these guys were doing, I mean, six weeks after Cowboy Stout was shot down and killed by an aircraft fire over Karor, in the approximate area of what we just showed you there, uh, the CO, the commanding officer of VMF-122, Major Quintus Nelson, was shot down and killed also. And they weren't the only guys who were, were shot down and killed by an aircraft fire. Uh, Quintus Nelson was found. He, he was missing, but he was, didn't Pat Scannon with the, you know, his whole endeavor of recovering lost airmen in the Palau's, Pat Scannon found Quintus Nelson uh, did he not, Damon? Isn't that correct? Uh, that I couldn't speak to. I do know Pat found Walter Brown's plane who survived, who bailed out when he was kind of same mission, though. Same same mission. Uh, so there were a lot of these guys right. who were victims of this AA fire. And like, like we've already touched on, the tragedy of it is, I mean, first Marine Division's back on Pavuvu. They're, they're training to then go on and hit Okinawa. You've got other Marines hitting Iwo Jima. You know, you You've got, of course, Saipan and the Marianas had, had been a few months before the Palau's, but the war is moving on. These guys are still on Peleliu, and they're getting up every day, and they're strapping in these Corsairs, and they're flying. Some of them had to just feel like it was a pointless mission, but 
you know, they were trained Marine aviators. They did what they were told. Mm -hmm. They didn't question their orders. And then, but the tragedy of it is when you see a guy like Robert Cowboy Stout, who March 4th, 1945, I mean, so close to the end of the war. And he shot down and, and, you know, and killed by an aircraft fire. And, and, and just, it, it really is, it just heightens the tragedy of it. And, and, you know, Damon was kind enough to send me all of Cowboy's records. And I mean, to look through that and see the letter that was written to his, his mom and dad. And to see that, you know, dear Mr. And Mrs. Stout is a great regret. We inform you that your son, Major Robert S. Stout, has been missing in action. And, and you know, and, it's, and Damon, do you want to tell the story of uh, how long he was missing when he was found? Do you, do you want to handle that? Yeah, sure. So what you're looking at now, obviously, is is color film of 114. So a lot of what I was trying to do with this documentary, besides, you know, cover these guys' lives, is stick to as humanly possible as much as color footage. Um, of course, I'll you know there's black and white stills and whatnot. But as as we all know, when we see kind of uh, history based shows, especially with World War II, it's it's almost a treat to see color. I mean, it's it's this kind of rarity. Um, obviously, there's colorized after the fact, but um, yeah. So to your point, Henry, uh, when when Cowboy was killed, and I touched on it a little bit, but the fog of war, fog of battle, um, obviously Bud was broken up, uh, Cantrell, all the guys, they went back to the um, Peleliu right there, as you see. Um, they had two more missions that day. So you land, refuel, rearm, go back. So Bud in his book doesn't really remember the flight back because he, he knew Cowboy was, was killed most likely. Um, and just obviously, you know, you have you have your job to do, you have work to do. Um, so you go back, you fly two more missions after that. Meanwhile, you're still looking for them. You're still trying to get them on the radio, um, all those types, types of things. So when he was killed in 45, it took two years um, to find his plane, to find his remains, um, which were eventually, you know, shipped back to, to Wyoming. Which side note I visited, um, the homestead is still there, his parents. Um, so I have, uh, you know, some footage of where he grew up, even some of his toys he played with um, mm -hmm. to, to connect all of this on the personal level and a human level. Uh, but yes, yeah, so it was two Palauan women that found him um, in 1947. So they were looking for, for crabs and uh, that type of thing. So. His plane is still in the mangrove swamp. It's been subsequently, I don't want to say lost again, but nobody's really found it since 1947 because of uh, Graves' apartment, dead reckoning, you know, all this maps were what they were, you know, no GPS. Um, we kind of have an idea of where it is. I mean, I think Pat at one point looked for it. Um, when I went to Palau a couple of years ago, that's not really the point of the documentary is to find his plane. Of course, I, you know, if I can, that would be great because it's, it's been lost since 1947. Um, and, you know, his name is still on the, the fuselage. Um, there was quite the description of finding the plane in 1947. Wow. It was but, a tough place to get to from what I've heard. Well, that's, you know, the mangrove video that you just sh showed there, <laughs> you know, if people know what the mangroves are or not, um, I, I thought I did, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to walk through this nonsense. It's, it's impossible. Um, That's a good point to mention because people are mentioning in the sidebar that obviously the footage you took to have taken of mangrove swamps now is not how it would look like. Even in 1947, just two years later, the growth wouldn't have come back. Because people are reminding us, of course, that this island, as we can see from the aerial photos, it looked like, you know, bomb craters and coral so much of the vegetation has just been destroyed because of the combat there so finding sure. an aircraft in 1947 then refinding it again 80 70 80 years later is a very different prospect as everything's changed but i want to kind of keep things on track with this idea of peleliu and and you know that you, you mentioned two both of you mentioned some things i wanted i want to come back to henry you sure. talked about this overriding sense of not some of these parts not really sure quite what they're doing you know that sort of sense of why we especially when the, the campaign has moved on elsewhere and you're still doing these missions which also connects as well with this idea that if you become a quote unquote fighter pilot as we established already you kind of want to shoot down enemy aircraft that's your 
that's what that's the schoolboy dream is to have those if you're in the ETO, you know, the swastikas on the side of your aircraft you've shot down if you're in the pacific you have the 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 the, the rising suns that you're shooting down so ground support although integral for your father henry isn't necessarily right. what these guys want to be doing and the other thing is just the intensity of these missions you're saying that you know the mission where they lose one of their absolute beloved leaders and pilots and inspirational figures they're straight back out with two more missions that that very same day. So mm. while we've got these incredible color footage f stills up, Damon or and Henry, just take us through the arrival of of the squadron on Peleliu and what a typical kind of week would be like for these days. How many missions? What kind of information are they getting? The precision of their target information. What 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 is their day to day role in the, the close air support uh, in Peleliu? Can we find, because I think the picture that would really speak to this, Damon, it's the one you and I talked about earlier. There's a picture, it shows Cowboy and several Marine officers looking at a map on the ground. And a couple of the Marine officers are smoking cigarettes. If we could find that picture, and I know, Paul, there's a lot of stuff you've got there. Uh, but yeah, color one or black picture, yeah you're, you're almost there, Paul. Uh, is that one that that's it. Okay. Uh, Damon, can I speak to this picture? Or do you yeah, want to? Absolutely. So in this photograph, this is actually this picture is in my dad's book. Right on the left of the photograph, wearing the khaki colored hat, that's Cowboy Stout right there in his flight suit. Um, the man to hit to, to the right of him, I'm not sure who that is, but going on, but basically center of the photo, the gentleman got a cigarette in his hand, no shirt. That's Bucky. That's Colonel Bucky Harris. 5th Marines commander, okay, 5th Marine regimental commander. Uh, the gentleman who's got a towel around his neck pointing at the at the map, I can't tell who that is. I might can look in my dad's book if you guys jump to something else. But the, the guy with the curly blonde hair, I believe that is Major Gus Gustafson. He took over as 3rd Battalion commander when Austin Schaffner was hit on D-Day, which my dad remembers when that happened. Gus Gustafson took over as 3rd Battalion commander and Woody, I know you're real familiar with my dad's book. Damon, I know you are, but maybe not quite so as Woody. <laughs> Woody, do you remember when my dad talked about going on patrol in the mangrove swamp and they spent the night and the and the poor guy got killed with the entrenching to Yeah. Do you remember yeah. that episode? Well, so Lieutenant Hillbilly Jones was commanding that patrol. Uh and I'm not trying to go down a rabbit hole. I'm just drawing a comparison. You know, I'm you drawing like a line. Here. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Well, Lieutenant Hillbilly Jones was commanding that patrol. The next morning, after he called the gentleman you see there with the curly hair looking over the shoulder of the guy there on the right of the photograph, that was Major Scott, Major Gustafson. And he called Major Gustafson and said, you know, hey, Gus, we've had a bad night. I want to bring these guys in. And, and Major Gustafson um, said, well, you know, Hillbilly, I really wish you guys to stay out. I mean, we, we think that that the Japs are out there in force. We'd really like it if you'd stay out and try to probe that. And Hillbilly said, and you know, Hillbilly was just absolutely so well thought of kind of on the level of that cat Um, And he said, look, we've had a bad night. We need, I think we need to bring these guys in. And so major Gustafson said, okay, if, if that's your call, I'll, I'll trust your judgment. I'll send a tank and a relief column through the jungle to come get you, uh, which they actually showed in the Pacific. Let, let me, deviate here you guys talk about talk amongst yourselves let me find because i, I can I, identify I, the other. I want to just say that from what you've said about that photo henry this is what as a normandy guy because i'm an unashamed normandy guy this is what yeah. your average normandy guy would have loved to have seen happening squadron leaders with regimental leaders on the ground in the same place looking at a map and going we want you to hit that bit right there because in normandy as effective as air power was there's chains of command there's links there's stages there's observers who radio who someone else and, inter and someone interprets a photo who says something else intelligence officer says something to like that then a briefing officer tells someone else and so on and so forth and the air power the air support does come in but it's missing right. the intimacy and immediacy and effectiveness, frankly, of the actual guys who are in command of the respective units around the same map in the same place saying, hit that bush there because that's where the, yeah. the damn enemy are. This is pure, absolute ground and air support working theoretically in perfect harmony. I think it's just an amazing photo. And it is because – did you want to say something, Damon? Yeah, I'm sorry. Just to interject, um, that's a still. 
So this is actually from film, you know, and, and I don't want to keep harping on that, but to find color footage, you know, still is amazing, a black and white, but to actually find the color yeah. footage. Um, and if you go one picture up, it's the same guys, but um, there's- That's the, from my dad's book. Hang on. There's the corresponding- is that how, how uh, Henry, there we go. Yeah, they're the same photo, yep, yep. Yep, so that still that you're showing, Paul, is a still from 16 millimeter footage. Uh, and then and it also corresponding. Sorry, to also visible in that photo. And, and again, to, to your point, Woody, I mean, you've, yeah, you've got some high level guys, shirts yeah. off, they're smoking cigarettes, they're hot as hell. Uh, oh, right to, to the left of Bucky Harris, I believe that is Colonel Lewis Walt. Uh, Colonel Walt was an iconic Marine going back to Cape Gloucester. I mean, well-documented history. The guy with the gentleman with the towel over his neck is Major Gordon Gale. Another, uh, I believe, let's see, Gordon Gale. Yeah, Major Gordon Gale. And I think he was another battalion commander. And I'm dropping which unit it was exactly. I'm trying to recall all I can. But but to your point, Woody, yeah, I mean, that that's a meeting of the minds right there. And so they've got the aviator. They've got cowboy right there. And I, I would just love to know what these guys are saying. I mean, if I could hear what they were saying. <laughs> I actually, this, I'm not going to do this. There's, there's, I, I was thinking about getting, you know, people who read lips because I think Peter Jackson did that for the world war, world war one film. Yeah. 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 That he put out. Uh, and like, that's, you're right, Henry. There's, there's watching this footage. Uh, you can clearly, but you know, look, it is what it is. We have the AAR, the corresponding AAR to that day, which was uh, October 9th, 1944. Um, and yeah, that was five sisters. They were getting ready to go up into that area. That so, uh, so real, real quick, I'm sorry. That picture. So, I, sorry, we, we we this is really fantastic, but I think we could end up being here four hours if I don't manage our discussion a little bit more. So, sure. you know, I, I, I that was an amazing little 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 rabbit hole there about that that photo. But so let's sorry. Let's, <laughs> no, no, it's fantastic. I love it. But let's talk about what these guys are actually doing. Take us through, I don't expect there is an absolutely typical mission, but take us through a, you know, you talked about the fact, this this idea, the fact they're hardly, you know, raising the undercarriage because they're off and they're taking off and they're landing again. So they're getting information in this kind of everybody around a map saying, we need well, we need you over here. Then you take off. Um, so so run us through the, the a, a typical mission, if you wouldn't mind. Damon, you want to speak to that? I'm actually trying to find something in here where my dad talks about watching him drop the napalm. Or I don't have to do that because I don't want to I don't want to delay the process. Do you want do you want to kick that yeah. off, Damon? Or? I mean, again, from what I know, talking to Bud, reading his book, reading Ken Troll's book, these interviews, I don't know if there is a typical in as much as you know, there would be strafing, there would be napalm, there would be the high explosive ordinance, they would fly obviously from Peleliu, um, all over the place. Um, missions, you know, further further north. Um, the casualties incurred besides AA were largely because, as, as Henry said, there's no zeros anymore, there's no planes, would, would be, I, I don't want to say pilot error, but, you know, if you don't pull up quick enough, you know, you're, you're in the mountain. Um, so I've got we, a great passage from Bud's book I can read if you want that speaks yeah. to the question. Yep. All right. So, so this is from Lieutenant Daniel's book. Uh, yep. This is Cowboy's Wingman. Okay. Um, let's see. To answer Woody's question, what, what's a typical mission if you can find that? So uh, finally, on the 8th of October, Cowboy's flight of four Corsairs loaded 265 gallon tanks, which had been used as fuel tanks with jellied gasoline, napalm, and dropped them on the cave entrances of Bloody Nose Ridge. Holy cow, what a deadly area of fire. Napalm either sucked the air out of caves or burned the occupants to death. Hence the squadron's jacket emblem, our symbol for the death dealers. Wow. But it, it would have been, to, to speak further to that, I mean, they take these guys out to the flight line. They're, they're, they're ground crewmen and plane captains. You know, it's hot as hell. They're going to be uh, not wearing anything but a pair of shorts, all suntanned almost to the just being burned, you know, from that constant heat and sun of Peleliu. 
the, they're loading napalm. They're either loading 500 pounders or 1,000 pounders on the bellies of these Corsairs, uh, a lot of which were not the F4U1 Corsairs. A lot of VMF 114s planes, incidentally, were the FG1D Corsairs built by Goodyear under license, which didn't have the folding wings. Uh, but they would have been bombing these planes up. Uh, they, they'd take the pilots out there on a Jeep. The guys would have all their gear on. They'd get out. They, they'd go to their respective Corsairs. The, they'd buckle in. The plane captain would be helping them get their radio cord hooked up, you know, running a systems check on everything. Uh, they'd stand by. One thing I saw when I went to Peleliu was uh, the remains of shotgun shells, 10-gauge shotgun shells. The reason for that was Corsairs, the earlier Corsairs used shotgun starters. The, mm. the plane captain would put a shotgun shell in an access panel uh, by the engine, and then the pilot would fire that shotgun shell off, and it would kick the prop over so that it would catch. And so all around the airfield, we saw these little, you know, heads of shotgun shells. But they would taxi out. They would take off. As we discussed earlier, in many cases, not even raise the landing gear, head right into that kind of terrain, just off the end of the runway, Bloody Nose Ridge. Um, and they would know where they were going because of meetings like we just saw the photograph of with between Cowboy and, and the regimental and battalion commanders. Uh, and they'd be saying things like, it'd be great if you guys could lay some napalm down there in Five Sisters because they're tearing our guys up. And so, you know, Cowboy probably would have said, OK, man, we'll, I'll take my guys in there and we'll blanket the area for you and see what we can do. And and they would go in and just drop these thousand pounders. And, you know, the, and now we get into the not to delve too deeply into the ground side of the campaign, because that's not what we're here to talk about. But the reality of it was, I mean, I know my father told me he heard testimony and, and that's footage from the headquarters building near the airfield. Uh, but he heard testimony of a Japanese prisoner of war after the war that said, uh, you know, we were back in our caves. All those bombs did was make big noise. And so what had to happen was then Marines had to go in with flamethrowers and bazookas and, you know, root them out one by one. Um, mm. you know, there well, you see I'm some... glad you mentioned that point there, Henry, because sometimes we have this idea you know, we got. I'm, I'm, a norm, I'm going to do a Normandy story. My apologies, but we've got the anniversary of the Falaise Gap coming up. You know, in, in the next couple of weeks, and we have this idea of air power going in and kind of doing the job on its own. You know, pretty much literally taking out a column of German armor. We right. must be clear about the air close air support here. It's never going to completely eradicate an enemy because of caves. You're right. Because the Japanese use the terrain. It's it's a huge advantage for, for, for guys like your dad, Henry, but they've still got to go up those ridges. They've got to still hack through that that, that jungle and clear out those caves and those positions there. It's an a, amazing tool, air power, out of your toolbox, but it's not it's not a cure-all, is it? Well, in the perfect example, that would be in Gasebus. The, the, the footage that we talked about, uh, the, what I read from my father's book there at the beginning of the show, Perfect example of the guys, like they're coming ashore in their amphibious tractors as Cowboy and Bud and the rest of the guys from 114 are, are lining up and strafing the beach um, and, you know, hitting them with 50 cal and everything else to keep the Japanese pinned down. And they did that beautifully, but that still didn't keep the Marines from having to debark from their amphibious tractors and literally go through that island pillbox by pillbox, cave by cave and completely secure it. So the, to your point, it, it it was a bilateral effort. Mm. It took everybody. Yes, mm. air power was huge. It was tremendous. I, too, have read about Falaise Gap. And, I mean, you had Germans getting bottled up and P-47s coming in and strafing them. And now we're really going down a rabbit hole and we'll do that because <laughs> I love yeah, P-47s. No. But. Every, everyone watching is having a drink every time we say rabbit holes. If we keep saying, we have some very drunk viewers very short. But um, there's nothing wrong with that as long as they're not driving, folks. As long as you're in the company. And that's Damon on the airfield, by the way. Yeah, and people are loving the video footage. And obviously, you know, we're only giving little snippets of what's going to be this fully produced documentary that the link to is in the web, in the description below, folks. So go and check out Damon's website and, and we'll all look forward with great anticipation of this film. But, um, the, the you know that this this idea of the, the the close contact i think that's what's surprising people is that this is again i'm going to reference this idea that 
that they're, they're side by side. The Marines in the air and the Marines on the ground are living pretty much in the same places. They're kind of using the same showers if there are showers. They're getting the same information from the same reconnaissance patrols. So it is it is almost the perfect symmetry, but symmetry between these two units. So you've talked about your father's memories of of the aviation coming in. Damon, what about the the the, the, the air crews that you've read their accounts, you've read these books, how did they feel about the Marines on the ground? Did they, did they, did, did they feel that they were doing as much as they could to help those guys? I think so. And again, going to Bud's book and, and specifically his recollection and, and Henry, if you remember this too, you know, chime in. Um, yeah. It was a mission, completed mission, Bud's shutting down, taxied, engine off, crew chief comes up and Bud sees a Marine coming toward him. And I don't remember the specifics if he was disheveled and or just the thousand yard stare type of thing, but Bud actually his recollection, cause you know, they're like you guys have been saying this close air support, God forbid you hit somebody, you hit one of your own guys. Yeah. You're, you're mm -hmm. that close, that low. Anyways, this Marine's walking toward him and Bud, said he was kind of scared, like he didn't know the intention, the eyes, the focus, super intense. Um, so Bud dismounted and walked up, and I think he just – I don't think he said a word. I think he shook his hand, hand. I've got the passage right here in the book. Okay, great. Read it. Do you want me to read it? I don't yeah, want to please. Read it. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. I, I believe this exactly. Yeah. And I love that you're continuing to show the pictures while I do this. So yeah, I think this is exactly what Damon was talking about. I'm reading from, from Bud Daniels book here, Cowboy Down. On the 14th of October, we flew two more napalm drops on Bloody Nose Ridge, as well as our first scramble alert flight. Alerts were defensive tactics to engage boogie, bogeys, radar images of jet planes. Four or more Corsairs were always combat ready on the flight line. Each plane was manned by a pilot, either sitting on the wing or in the cockpit, ready to take to the air immediately. Radar then vectored the plane to intercept the bogey. We had one more alert on the 15th that was a second dry run on an actual radar blip. While sitting in number 016, that was the side number of the Corsair, on the scramble alert, a Marine sergeant climbed up on my wing and wanted to shake my hand for the napalm bombing runs we had made. He was limping from being hit in his leg a day or two previous. I asked him how long he had been overseas. He said this was his fifth, his fifth invasion in over 35 months. He had the thousand mile stare and it almost scared me to look at him. He had been through Guadalcanal, then sent to Melbourne, Australia for R&R. &R. There, several young Marines went AWOL, thinking they had died and gone to heaven with beer and girls so plentiful. The shore patrol gathered the men up and told them there would be, told them, there would be two ways they would return stateside when the war was over or in a wooden box. He shook my hand, slid down off the wing and gimped away, hoping for hot food and a shower after nine days of combat. I will never forget his look. Wow. So that's a good example like Damon was talking about. And that's a beautiful shot right there of seeing a Corsair in his run taken from another aircraft right behind him. But that's a great example of the aviators having some face-to-face -face contact with the guys on the ground. I mean, every, everything I've ever read, I think those pilots were sensitive to the fact that they were supporting the, the guys on the ground. I don't think they ever forgot that. Well, I think it's been said already. They, they are all Marines, aren't they? It's an obvious thing to say, but they all have that same ethos, that same understanding yes. that, that, and, you know, again, if we're talking about, the U.S. Army relating with the U.S. Army Air Force or the British, in, you know, infantry working alongside the British Royal Air Force, you get that separation of branches. You get the fact they're wearing a different uniform. They, they, their, their, their traditions are different. Their doctrine is different. Their, their ranks are different. And I think with the Marines, there's something about the purity of the fact they are all the same. And people have been specified. There are quite a few former Marines who never, you're never an ex-Marine. You're just a Marine who's, who's right. not. And, not, not older but this idea that no matter what your role is you still go through that you know you still go through that boot camp you still go through that this is what it's like to be a marine you're still a marine first and a specialist whether you're a pilot a radar operator or or a, or a cook you're still a marine first and i think <clears> this is coming into the fore here of this cooperation between these guys they've all got the same intention they're all coming at it for the same purpose and th there's a camaraderie and a trust because 
we've talked about when we did the ground shows, Henry, yeah, that we're talking about a not very large, Peleliu is not a large space. It's not like, you know, North right. Africa. You get right. this, you get your target wrong. You pick, you fly up the wrong ridge and you go out and you take the wrong valley and you drop your napalm or your, your rockets in the, in the wrong place. And and you're kill you're it's blue on blue. You're killing you're killing your own people. So it, it, the the fine line between doing your job and getting it badly wrong is there all the time. It's the the pressure must have been immense. That that same ethos was really there, and that's a great shot of the guys near their ready tent. Um, great shot of the guys in their flight gear. The interesting thing on in that photograph right there, you see the guys the May West they're wearing on the right side of the photograph are the the more common later model um and if i'd look through my flight gear book i i could remind remind myself exactly what the model designation was but the aviator leaning against the sign is wearing one of the earlier model uh life vests life jackets you know that was more commonly worn earlier like in the solomon's campaign mm -hmm. but that ethos that i was talking about that you mentioned woody that continued through the entire war i mean there there's as you know, I'm researching my dad's unpublished writing. Yep. Um, I don't want to give it up, but man, there's a beautiful anecdote that speaks to that that happened with a TBM pilot, which is a torpedo bomber on Okinawa. And uh, just a really cool thing when I came to it. And I was like, man, I can't believe they didn't publish that. But um, yeah, more on that later. But yeah, those the Marines in the air knew why they were there. Yeah, no, definitely. So while we've got a couple of pictures of Corsair up there, who wants to do a kind of a basic 101 guide to this, the qualities of the Corsair? We don't want to turn this into a too techie kind of show, but we, you know, it was it was pretty well suited to this kind of role, wasn't it? I mean, we, we think about it, you know, with the folding wings, the carrier aspect of it, but it was well suited. So so one of you take us through its 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 qualities in terms of this particular role of close air support. You want to take a shot at that, Damon, to start off with, and I can certainly jump in too. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the guy for for this techie stuff, anyways, with this. But uh, the thousand horsepower power, two thousand horsepower. You see right away. I'm wrong. Well, you, you want me to jump it? <laughs> well, I don't care. My only anecdote with this, and again, I think coming from Bud's book as well, but just the history, wasn't it um, Lindbergh that basically figured out how to keep it from rolling and crashing all the time like charles Lindbergh. it was you well, know Lindbergh, yeah charles Lindbergh came over and and flew with marine aviators quite a bit he also flew with the army i mean he he really worked with aviators in the pacific of all branches trying to help them with fuel management mixture management you know prop rpm he of course was an expert aviator and so uh, Lindbergh spent a lot of time with American aviators in the Pacific. But if you want to speak to the Corsair, I mean, you know, they called it the beast. Um, the F6F Hellcat, the F4U Corsair, the P47 Thunderbolt, and the reason I mentioned that plane, those three planes shared the same engine, the Pratt & Whitney R2800 double row WASP radial engine. Um, it was a beautiful engine, 2000 horsepower. It, it could just withstand an enormous amount of punishment. Uh, the Corsair and the Hellcat both had that engine for Navy and Marine use. The Hellcat was a great airplane. I love reading about it. Certainly had the highest aerial kill ratio at 19 to 1, I think, of, of any American fighter. But it was a more tame airplane than the Corsair. When the Corsair first came out, uh, the Navy, you know, the reason the Marines started flying it was because the Navy was like, we can't land this thing on a carrier. Um the reason that it has the gull wings is because it had the largest propeller ever mounted on an airplane at that time, which it had to have to harness the, the power of that Pratt & Whitney 2000 horsepower engine. Uh, if they didn't tank the wings downward, the oleo struts would be too long. And so when they would come in for carrier landings, the airplane would just bounce. And I've seen footage of it, man. It, it's just, I can't imagine trying to land with those things on a carrier before they worked all the bugs out. But, they they kink the wings downward to keep the landing gear shorter, okay? So the run out on the oleo struts wouldn't be too great. And, and you know, the plane could bounce a little bit, but not too much. Um, landing it on a carrier was difficult because it had such a long nose. You know, the, uh, the Corsair pilots and VF-17 famously called them hogs. Uh, some of them called them hose nose. You know, they, they just... 
I think that nose extended out like 12 feet from the cockpit. I mean, you know, imagine, I mean, I have a few hours as a pilot in, in, in a Cessna, not many. Uh, I know what it's like to taxi a tricycle uh, landing gear airplane, but I can't imagine taxiing a, you know, a tail dragger, especially one, you know, with, with that long of a nose out in front of you. But they learned, I mean, they learned to just kick the rudders back and forth to work the nose. Just It was like watching a snake slither when it would, when they would taxi those things because they were had to do that to be able to look around the nose. Um, but once they got the thing, once they got the bugs worked out of it, it was a superb airplane. I mean, it was in production longer than any other piston engine fighter, I think out to 1952. Uh, so it saw service in Korea. It saw service in World War II. It was a, a beautiful close air support platform. It was um, such a versatile airframe. I mean, you had versions of it. the F-41C was built with 420 millimeter cannon. Uh, they didn't build that many of those. You know, the, it was more commonly the F-41A and then the 1D. Um, but and then the F-4U4, which came in and was used on Okinawa. You know, by the time the Corsair was used on Okinawa, they were hanging eight H-4 rockets on rails underneath the wings. Um, and so just a fantastic air to air airplane and air to ground. It could drop bombs. It could shoot rockets. It was fearsome in the air to air roll. It's kill ratio. I think was 11 to one, not as high as the Hellcat, but still uh, an airplane to be feared. It's been famously quoted. And if I need to shut up and let somebody else talk, I will. Well, I mean, obviously it's not as good as the Typhoon. Let's be clear on that. You know, I'm a Brit. It's my show. It's clearly not as good as the Typhoon. Oh, <laughs> I love the Typhoon, Woody. I love the Typhoon, but I, I don't know. The Corsair was a pretty tough airplane. No, it's, I, I, but I do I, love I, Tempest and Typhoons. Yeah, I mean, it's... It, 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 it's we, we, we've talked about it with John McManus. We've talked about it with other things. 44... There, there's two there's two 1944s in some ways. If you're down in the hellhole that is any of these places that we thought about, Peleliu, and then later on Saipan, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, it's it's just one shit day after another shit day, and it feels miserable, and the enemy in front of you don't want to give up, and and so on and so forth. There's that there's that 1944. Then there's a the 1944 that we now look at from the objectivity of being historians that we know. The, talk, the corner has been turned. The Allies are getting better at things. Air power is betting is more is more influential. We're getting better at amphibious landings, and it's only a matter of time, really, now before the Japanese are going to be going to be beaten. So it seems to me that this the whole Peleliu story of VMF one fourteen is this this not quite perfection yet, but it's 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 peaking. The ability for the Allies to do this stuff is reaching a point where it's getting to the point where it's getting really good results. And it's proven by the the, the incredible um, impact they have there in Peleliu. But, I mean, I, we'll, we'll move on to some other things. Whether, what you want to talk about, I don't know. People aren't necessarily coming in with questions, because I think they're just spellbound. Benjamin Allen is saying, Hellcat's better than Typhoon uh, and the Corsair. So there, there you are. I mean, that's, there's another... another. It's When we get into who's got the favorite aircraft, there's no winning of these discussions. <laughs> just, just, I the only way you just keep drinking alcohol till yeah. someone passes yeah, out. Rabbit sinkhole. That's the yeah, I'm, I'm abstaining from that conversation 100%. <laughs> right. I loved them all. Although I love the Thunderbolts, I love the Corsairs, yeah. I love the Tempest and Typhoons, and the you know, yeah. I, I loved them all. To no, be but yeah, we've got some great visual material. So go ahead, Woody. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, so let's let's bring it back because we know we are talking about Peleliu. So when we're when you know, Henry, we've talked about it before, you know, you're at the point now where you're not just um, talking about what your father did. You're in the kind of analysis phase of understanding what it is, the legacy. We talked about that on the first show. You're, you're, you're trying to collect the rest of your, pa your father's memoirs and writings and diary notes and so that to, to kind of do the, the definitive version. And this understanding now of, of what, what is it about the, 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 the Peleliu story that is, that is what we should now understand. What, what, Damon's film, the film you're working on, what, what's the one takeaway you want this uh, to, to give, to remind people about this, this aspect of World War II? Well, let's, Damon, do you want to speak to that since? Sure. I mean, my, again, not being the historian, I'm, I'm coming at this from an um, incredibly personal, very small, you know, look, when I started this, I, I had these mantras of, I'm not trying to retell the story of the Pacific. I'm not trying to say, I can't do that. It's, it's way beyond my, my scope. 
what I can do and I hope to do, um, especially talking to Bud um, and, and his knowledge of who Cowboy was, is convey many things, but one of which this small story of basically these two brothers who were killed, um, you know, small, small farm in um, Wyoming. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's emulating this. It's, it's mirroring these other stories that we've all heard through, through these 20 something year olds uh, who, who basically were killed in service. So what I would like is as many people gravitate toward whatever material for world war two, um, if it's, you know, I'm a historian or, or, you know, like or scares, that type of thing is to understand these kind of smaller stories set in the scope of this giant global conflict. So because of the material that, again, thank you for flipping through, um, these color films, these, these firsthand accounts, the war diaries, the AARs, the maps, um, you know, there's so much I could get bogged down in. And, and like I said earlier, this has almost been five years that I've been doing this. So it's kind of curating everything, but still keeping this smaller scope. Like, don't, you know, don't try to retell the story of the, the Pacific. Don't try to tell even to the extent of, of Pelo and Palau, because I, I, you know, of course, I want to cover Guadalcanal as well. But again, it would just be coming from a family's perspective of uh, looking through, you know, pretend you have this this handwritten diary, handwritten letters, which which I do. Um, and, and using these voices to, to hopefully speak to the viewer. Yeah, let, well, let me add yeah. one thing. Perfect. If, before, before you come in, Henry, why don't we just play the, 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 the trailer you've got so far that's yes. got audio on it so that we have an understanding of the, where the film is going? Because, you know, I, I'm coming at this from my World War II TV host. Which it's all about the history. It's all about where does this sit in the context of World War II because that's <clears> what I do. But I completely get and understand that from the storytelling point of view, it's about two brothers. It's about this loss. So let's let's play the the, um, the video now. Then we'll come back and carry on the conversation. I'll, I'll, I'll fire that up here. We go. <laughs> And just to tell you, folks, because I was uploading that immediately there, for, even though with my with my fiber optics, it was still juddering Damon's wonderful soundtrack. Just a fraction there, a little bit of a bit of a lag there, but it gives us an idea of the feel of things there. So it's all about this combination of trying to explain history, but also explain this personal stories, which is is what all World War II storytelling should be about conveying those two things. I know Henry, you know, you've very been much been working with Sol David on on his his forthcoming book, and it's it's that. Sure. Like we talk about the symmetry between the ground war and the and the the air war, it's the symmetry between storytelling and and conveying of history. It's that you get that right, the perfect balance, and it, it all works perfectly. So, um, Henry, what do you think? What you were going to just say something there? So I'll hand it back to you. Well, yeah, a couple of things really quick. I, I wanted to say that Jack Stout, Cowboy's younger brother, was a Marine aviator. He was killed in a training accident, which in a way is even more tragic. Because he isn't that right, Damon. He was killed yeah. in Chicago, flying in Chicago uh, from. Yeah, he left Cherry Point to Chicago for a war bond drive. Inclement weather. Um, he was the only one killed, but I think there was some other crashes. I'd have to look again. And quick, you know, side note to this whole thing. I'm originally from Michigan, and where Jack was killed, 
turned out it was just like 20 minutes or so south of where I grew up as a kid. I never knew that. Um, so there's one of these things where, you know, I was tracking down a historical society um, because there's still remains, not, you know, big pieces of the plane, but there's still remains. There's a marker to him still in the middle of this field. Um, but yeah, Henry, to your point, I mean, it's at least as tragic, definitely, but uh, gut-wrenching that he, you know, he's the youngest, the baby of the family. One of the interviews I did real quick side note in Wyoming, it's, um, it was, you know, tr neighbors and, and this type of thing, but this, the story when, when the younger, uh, when Jack was killed, um, you know, the mom just was, was wrecked. I mean, literally the, the wanted to climb in the coffin with him um, type of thing. So um, anyways, go ahead. Well, and the other thing to speak more generally about what we're doing here with Cowboy Down and, and this documentary film and then just learning more about VMF 114, you know, what do you want? When I went to Peleliu, okay, in 1999, I mean, I've always loved airplanes. Um, love all World War II history, but the airplanes are, are just something about them that has always grabbed me. And, and so when, when we were walking around the airfield on my trip, you know, I remember asking the guys who were like Eric Maylander, my buddy, uh, who, who was with me on that trip. And I just, I knew my dad's story and I knew the, the ground Marines, but I wanted to learn more about these because, and I knew VMF 114 had been the squadron that was there alongside two others. But I was asking the guys, you know, as we're driving around in the van from site to site, I'm like, who are these pilots? Does anybody know their names? I mean, what, how old were they? What, you know, I just, because I didn't, at that point, I didn't know the history to that granular of a level. And, and I've told Damon this and, and I just, it's going to sound hokey, but I'm sorry. I really, I feel this way, you know, since I've gotten involved with Damon and started collaborating on this film, I almost feel like I've been like, I walk into this tent and all those guys are lined up just having a beer. And they're all just like, come on in, man. You want to hear, you want to know, you want to meet us. You want to hear our stories, have a seat. We'll tell you everything you want to know. And it's almost like I can see them, you know, cowboy and bud and, and, Cantrell and Wink Balter and all these other guys just, you know, sitting there just like, ask me anything, man. I'll tell you everything you want to know. And wow. it, I don't know that that just there's something about that that kind of strikes me. And so it's it's like getting a personal connection with who these guys were, who when I was growing up reading about my dad's story and hearing him talk about oh, those beautiful Marine Corsairs flying close air support. And now to, to be able to get this intimate with who those guys were, there's something that speaks to me in that. No, definitely. And it's, you know, as I said, I, I don't want to repeat myself, but I am going to repeat myself. It's, it's understanding that without understanding who they are is important, but without understanding the importance of what they did, it means who they are doesn't make any sense. If you just say, two farm boys going off to war that's that's a, it's an incomplete story but two guy farm boys going off to war who were integral to the success of the island hopping campaign and what they did on Peleliu was was dramatic and had an effect that then that makes the complete story and it's the as we said earlier it's the perfect symmetry between uh, personal storytelling and putting it in the context of, of what a squad like this did and, and the role of close air support so Anything else? We, we will bring things in fairness. If it's, it's, I'm, I'm getting a bit wary now, but I, I'm, I'm absolutely loving this. Right. Any points you want to make about either Corsairs or, or, or missions or the people or the conditions on Peleliu? Now, now is kind of your time. I would just add, you do? no. I mean, honestly, I would just add, um, you know, between Bud's book and Kentrell's book, the host of information that I've got firsthand, the photographs, uh, and, and just jumping into this four or five years ago with both feet. Um, I can't overstate. And by the way, Henry, what you just said with meeting these guys, I feel hundred percent the same way where you're just, you're a part of this, not interjecting yourself into the story, but you're a part of this in that you're documenting it. Um, and you're trying to do your damnedest to document it in a, in a respectful way with, with all due diligence. Um, but yeah, I, you know, get Bud's book, read it. Um, you know, hopefully we'll be wrapping on this film. Um, you know, the goal was this year, it, it may bleed into next year a little bit with some of the post-production stuff, which is a whole other story. Um, but yeah, the living condition, all of this, uh, all of this, I think, um, I'm hoping will, will be covered, uh, with the film and, and just a little bit of an insight, a little bit of a window, 
um, in, into what, what these guys did. And, and I want to applaud you, Damon, for, for A, doing a film, but also B, understanding that the sharing of history now has to be on a multimedia level. The, the old era of you do a film or a book or podcasts or school meetings or whatever is it's these days to reach the audience. It's a bit of everything. You know, you'll, you'll need to do the YouTube shows like this and podcasts with Henry, get the film out there, go and speak to people as well, because I, what, if I've learned one thing over the last two years of doing this is everybody takes their history in different ways. I'm a book buyer. I go to shops. I buy books. My post lady here in Normandy, as I hear her going past, her, curses me as that he's the English guy who always has heavy books coming pretty much every day in the post, which I am. But other people who, who are massive World War II TV fans aren't necessarily book buyers. They devour podcasts. They devour YouTube and video and documentaries and the power of film. And as you know, as a, as a composer, Damon, the power of, of the all senses being affected can do so much more than reading a book. You know, that, that little clip you showed us of, the, of Corsair's in flight over Peleliu and then a soundtrack playing over that, that reaches people in a way that books don't do so so thank you for taking it because I know, I know from my limited bit of work just how much time putting a film together <laughs> takes especially when you're pretty much doing it i suppose on your own really Damon. yeah 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 one man band but uh labor love you know wouldn't wouldn't want to be doing anything else right now brilliant so henry and it kind of uh, anything else you feel you need to say no, just it, it's uh, you know really enjoy being part of the project. I'm always happy to be on your show, Woody. Well, it, it won't be the last time. I will have at least one of you back, if not both of you back again. And I just wish you well with everything. So I think we've we've done the job of of it creating of explaining what the role was. We've we've honoured the individuals. We've talked about the film. So I think um we've we've kind of reached the point where we've reached natural conclusions. So. Henry, what's for you on the on the horizon in terms of you've got more of your what's your scuttlebutt podcast coming up? You're working on the, 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 your dad's work. What what's what's immediate in the pipeline for you? Well, as you know, Woody, I got uh, the latest issue of World War II magazine, uh, the cover story I wrote. So grateful yeah. to World War II magazine for publishing that. That contains a couple of little nuggets of the unpublished stuff from my dad's manuscript that I worked in there. And the inspiration for the article, Woody, was our buddy, John McManus. He had a, he said something and it struck with me. I'm like, yeah, I need to try to write an article on that. Uh, enough on that. The only other thing I want to mention coming up is uh, I actually will be on a speaking panel with Richard Frank and Saul David at the International World War II Conference in New Orleans in November. Um, so I was honored to be asked. I mean, that yeah, that's the kind of stuff uh, that I would just... Well if you, if you wouldn't mind dropping a little word about what I do to Richard Frank, because I have tried to reach him and not, not had an email back yet. So maybe a word in from Henry about the fact I, uh, I know he's incredibly busy because he's doing the third volume of his second book, volume, second volume, second volume. I'd love to get him on and have his, has his wisdom on my channel. So if you can kind of put well, a good word in for me there, that'd be fantastic. I'll, what do you, I tell you this? I mean, Jeremy Collins at the museum, I, he and I talked about you the other, the night Jeremy called me to invite me to be on this panel at the international conference and he and I talked about you because he knows all of your work. He said, I've known Paul since for a long time. And he, he's, I guess he was kind of trying to throw me a little compliment because he said, Paul does not suffer fools gladly. No, oh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know where I've earned that from, but no, I've known Jeremy a long time. It, it's sounding like if people watch this now, we're just, we're just name dropping our mates there. But that's the thing I've learned is that everybody knows someone else. That someone that I know already knows the circle seems it closes up. There's so many connections. People know right. someone, someone else, and it's you know John Curatolo who did the who did the, um, the the talk about the strategic bombing. He's just taken yep. a position up at World War II Museum, so he's in the next office to Jeremy Collins now. So it's a it's a it's an incredibly small world. But we've covered what you're doing, Damon. Um, how can anyone watching this help with your project? Obviously, when the film comes out, they can get out by you're going to be having it available to stream and blah blah blah. But anything anyone can do now to help out. No, uh, but I appreciate that. I think at this point, um, I could be doing this the rest of my life, meaning, you know, detective work and, and rap uh, travel and all that. I think I have what I need uh, unless, uh, yes, of course, unless somebody out there has uh, any footage or any story. Is there was someone out there whose dad or grandfather was a, yeah. uh, a pilot or career yep. crew? And have unpublished diary. It's not quite too late if they get in touch. So your contact details in the description below. 
Henry, people can reach and t- get in touch with you via via Facebook and, and what have you and stuff. So if people have got questions, yeah. we'll do that. But I think we'll bring things in. So, folks, I'll just take you off screen and I'll, and I'll remind you So what we've got coming up. So tomorrow evening, back to the normal time, 7 p.m. UK, Russell Lowe is coming on to talk about a B-24 that was shot down over New Guinea. And it's a particularly a personal story to him because as a Chinese-American, his relatives are involved in that as Chinese-Americans. It's a great story, again, of what we've been doing about a crew of people coming from all corners of the USA, different backgrounds, different races, different ideals, coming together as a crew, becoming a unit, and then being shot down of New Guinea. So that'd be an amazing personal story. And I've seen his PowerPoint. It's amazing. some amazing imagery. And I've just scheduled another show for Friday, a little bit different time. It'll be 6 p.m. UK time. John Wills is coming on to talk about the forgotten POWs of Nagasaki. So these are some of the allied prisoners of war, British, American, and Australian and others who found themselves near Nagasaki on August the 9th when that atomic bomb fell and what happened to them. So that's another amazing show. And then next week, a kind of a random set of shows. Marty Morgan's coming on to talk about one of the Normandy myths. We've got John Buckley coming on at some point. We've got a show about the Falaise Gap coming up and lots of other things coming up. So as in, as always, stay tuned and check YouTube for notifications. But I'll bring our guests back in basically to say goodbye. So, folks, it's been fantastic. 90 minutes talking about mm-hmm. air power over Peleliu has been fantastic. So it's been a pleasure listening to your wisdom. Thank you incredibly so much for the incredible imagery, the footage, the photos, the stills, incredible supporting materials there. And I cannot wait to see the full finished documentary. So there we go. From Paul, Henry and Damon, this is thank you very much for watching. I will see you all tomorrow. Have a good evening, everybody. Cheers. Bye.